Okay, so we're going to talk about something called continuity. Um, there's a very simple and intuitive definition of continuity that is not usable in, as far as solving problems, answering questions on the AP test, that kind of stuff. But it is a good thing to file away in the back of your brain when approaching these kinds of problems. So on the activity you just finished, you ran into all kinds of problems, like the question that Molly asked about, we had a hole, but then there was also a value of the function above it. There were other instances where we had asymptotes and all kinds of other things. We're looking at, going to look at three main problems that cause a function to be discontinuous. Right, we're talking about continuity, but we're going to also look at where it's discontinuous. So quick. Uh, business here with uh, objectives. We're going to talk about uh, how to determine uh, whether a function is continuous or not. We're going to look at one-sided limits. We're going to talk about the properties of continuity. Not real exciting. Now we're going to talk about the intermediate value theorem. There is a rule in calculus. If a function has a, sorry, if a theorem has a name, it's important and will come back to haunt you later. That's not to say that if it doesn't have a name, it's not important. But these automatically become flashcard worthy if they have their own name. So we'll get to IBT towards the end of this lecture. And then, of course, you should be able to be a better listener for your friends and family. Good way to end your trying. OK, real simple. Continuity works this way. Can I draw that function without picking up my pencil? That's it. As you're working through these problems, that should be something in the back of your brain. If you can't, then it is what's called discontinuous. Now, you know it's not going to be that easy. We're going to have to do a little bit of work. So thinking back to those problems we just finished on the limit activity, what kind of things happened on the graph that caused the discontinuity? If you have to go back to the activity, that's OK. But you can also remember what the graph looked like. Right. Good, that's two of them. There's a third. Any idea? Say again? Okay, cusp. Um, good guess, but think about a cusp. Oh, Can you draw a cusp without picking up your pencil? Yeah. So it is. No? You can. You don't remember what a cusp is? Anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, chop, so it's like separated. A chop? <laughs> yeah. I've never heard it referred to that. Like kind of, when you, you go and then it just like starts randomly out here. Why chop? I don't know. It's like chopped up. I don't hate it. Jump. Or a jump. Yeah. Or that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, or well, we can go with jump. Not this not so That's a razor. Sure. Right? And that's it. Those are the three. There's no others. So we'll start by, uh, we, we answered that question already. Continuous means that in simplistic terms, can I draw this without picking up my pencil? That's not a mathematical definition. We talked about that already. What causes problems? We don't want to talk so much about how to make it continuous, it's much easier to look at what makes it discontinuous, where are the problems going to occur. Then we get into some calculus speak here. Function is continuous at C if there's no interruptions in the graph. And you nailed it. Three possible interruptions. Holes, jumps, or chops, and asymptotes. Now this terminology you should get comfortable with at the, at the point where x equals c. c is some constant. It can be positive, it can be negative, it could be zero. It's any possible number on the entire graph. This is huge, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this, because it would be nice if they just said to us, hey, is this function continuous? And you would say, no, it's not, because I can, can't draw it without picking up my pencil. And that happens because there's a jump. But it's not that easy. You'll notice this is called the formal definition of, oh, it doesn't say that up there, does it? This is called the formal definition of continuity. There's three parts to it. In red, is how I think you should think about it. It'll make it a lot easier. F of C is defined, doesn't mean a lot to people. It might, but usually 
the function being defined will make more sense. Part two, it has to have a limit. At that point C, again, notice we're talking about a particular point C. And in part three, number one and number two have to have the same value. So the three things that we talked about, hole, asymptote, and jump, are going to violate those three rules. And so we need to look at what it looks like when we violate those three rules. Again, for those of you that are interested, I mentioned this last time, but I did post the slideshow ahead of time. If you want to take notes on the slideshow, it'll save you some time. You don't have to. I'm just trying to make your life a little bit easier. Everybody good to go? Beautiful. Okay, so let's start with this guy. First of all, quick pre-calc review. We talked about this before, but I'll say it again. How do you generate a hole on a graph? It's where a, a, a term on the numerator cancels with a term on the denominator, simplifies into a hole. So if you factor x squared minus 1, you get x squared or x minus 1, x plus 1, x minus 1 is canceled. x plus 1 with a hole at 1. And when you do that, we generate a hole. The technical term for this is called a removable discontinuity. Once everybody's caught up, we're going to talk about what of the three things in that formal definition does that violate. Okay, everybody good so far? Three parts, formal definition of continuity. Number one. Well, first of all, let's do this. Are there any points on the graph where it might be discontinuous? It's kind of an obvious question, but I'll ask it anyways. You don't have to raise your hand. Good. Okay, I commonly call that a funky point. Things might get funky at x equals 1. So that becomes my C term. Is there a value at f of 1? No. Okay. Does not exist. And we can... S that was wild. We could just stop right there. I think I got too close to the buttons. As soon as one of the three things is violated, it's discontinuous and you can stop. That one's not very exciting because it stopped us right away. But let's continue just for giggles. Number two, does the limit as x approaches that funky point exist? Good. What is it? What's the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x there? 2. Good. And then part three, does number 1 Equal number two? Nope. You good? Yes? Audience participation part of the program. Are we good? Mm -hmm. yes. Excellent. Okay. Jump discontinuity. Also known as a chop. I'm going to use that kind of I like that a lot. <laughs> Chop discontinuity. Okay, we see it in piecewise functions. We've done a little bit about that. Obvious question of these, where's the funky point? Also known as? Perfect. Okay. Looking at the graph, he pointed x equals negative 2. You can also see it over here. Okay. If you don't have a picture of the graph, so that's going to be our funky point. All right, number one. Is there a value for f of negative 2? Ooh, a little bit of pre-calc stuff. Is there a value at negative 2? Yes. yes. What is it? 2. Not negative 1? No. Two. You're just going to keep shouting 2 at me? <laughs> Why? No, now why are you going to continue shouting two at me? What, why is the answer? If I didn't give you a picture, 
Could you tell me that this is equal to 2? Yeah. How would you know? Everybody's talking at the same time. Lily. In the function, um, x can't equal um, negative 2 in like the top one. Okay, that tells you where to plug in negative 2. Okay. Good, so that's fine. Let's continue on. Number 2, is there a limit as x approaches the, the, the funky point of negative 2? Two different values from each direction. Beautiful. Does not exist. Stay away from those arrows. If I want to get fancies in my pansies, I would say the left hand limit does not match the right hand limit. Therefore, there's no limit. We don't need to go on to number three because all of a sudden number two didn't work, so we stop. No continuity at negative two. But again, if for some reason you wanted to go on with number three, number one does not equal number two. Third discontinuity. Fancy schmancy term is an infinite discontinuity, also known as an asymptote. What makes the denominator equal to zero? Number one. This one is a train wreck. Well, uh, M, where's the funky point for this graph? Um, x equals zero. Good. What's f of zero? Doesn't exist. Yeah, does not exist. What's the limit as x approaches zero? Don't, like I said, this is a hot mess. What's three? Well, oh, wait a second. The, no, 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 that's cheating. They don't, ex they don't equal each other. Does not exist, can't equal, does not exist. Okay. That's like saying all unicorns are equal to dragons. Doesn't, doesn't calculate them. Okay. You will have to come back to this formal definition of continuity on a regular basis. That's what's going to justify your answer. You're going to be able to look at the graph very easily and say, Yep, there's a funky point. Yep, there's a hole there. Yep, it's discontinuity. It, it has discontinuity. The difficulty is going to be coming back to the formal definition of being able to go through those, those three steps every time. As soon as one of those is proven false, you're done. It's, discontin it's discontinuous. Questions? A little bit easier than Wednesday, yes? Good. All right, one-sided limits. We'll go through this very quick because it's not a major topic. But we take this function. The reason I chose this one is because we do need to talk about this because this type of function pops up repeatedly. This semicircle comes from the equation x squared plus y squared equals 4. Which, if I were to graph x squared plus y squared equals 4, what would I get? Circle with the center at. Zero, zero on a radius of, think carefully, two. two. Very good. Okay. When I solve that function, I get four possibilities. Top, bottom, left, and right. We care about the top and the bottom. Why wouldn't we care about the left and the right? Say loud, say proud. Now you're overthinking it. Okay. No. I take a circle. If I solve this for one of the variables, I'll either get a top, a bottom, a left, or a right. Why do I not care about left and right? No. They aren't functions. They aren't functions. Very good. Okay. So we're going to deal mainly with taking this puppy and solving it for y. y squared is equal to 4 minus x squared. Take the square root. We get plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared. Positive is the top. Negative is the bottom. Just like if you solve for x, the positive would be the right. The negative would be the left. But we don't care because, again, it's not a function. OK. So 
what is the following? What's the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x? So what's the what's the limit as x approaches one of f of x? Square root of three. Done. Okay. That doesn't work, and we need to change gears a little. Okay. What is the limit as x approaches negative two? possible answer would be zero. Anybody else? We're good with zero? It doesn't exist. Why? Because there's only one approach to zero from the right. But shouldn't we just plug and chunk? Suppose I didn't give you this. How would you know that the answer wasn't zero? Because the uh, limit from the left wouldn't be equal to the limit from the right. Just the one from the left would just not exist. Okay. I think 90% of the people asked would say the same thing you said because what have I burned in your brain? Plug and chug first. So Matthew's taking us to a higher level where you have to start thinking about domain restrictions, left-hand limits, right-hand limits. So let's come back to this in a second and change it a little bit. What's that equal to? What's the limit as x approaches negative 2 as you get closer and closer from the right? Yeah. Zero. Good. What's the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the negative side of the function? Does not exist. There's nothing over there to deal with is one way to think about it. There's no graph over there. The other, thing, the other way you can think of it is that numbers over there are outside the domain restriction of the original function. Notice our domain is restricted from negative 2 to 2. So getting back to the original problem, if we just look at negative 2, it would have no limit because the left-hand limit doesn't match the right-hand limit. Again, doesn't show up very often but it is something that I wanted to make sure you had seen before. With limits, you're going to get really tired of this left-hand limit match matching the right-hand limit. But it is a pretty important necessity in solving these limit problems. Do we did that already? Yeah. Okay. We've done this already? It warrants discussion again. Left-hand limit. Remember what I said when you were going to get sick of that? There it is again. You know what? Let's not even do the fancy definition. Okay. It's just a way of repeating what, we, what we've already said in a different manner. Properties of continuity. So this is easy. Remember we did with limits. The limit of a limit times a scalar is the scalar times the limit. The sum of a limit, sorry, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. Same thing is true with continuity. If you take two continuous functions and you add them together, you get another continuous function. You take two continuous functions, you multiply them together, you get a continuous function. It's pretty hard to make it discontinuous if you're starting with two continuous functions. How do you know if a function is continuous without going through all this rigmarole? This will save you a ton of trouble. Every single polynomial is continuous. And you'll notice in blue, I feel the need to ask the question, what is a polynomial? Because I used to assume that everybody knew it, and then we got into all kinds of problems. Eric, give me an example of a polynomial, please.
perfect. Good. Okay, give me an example of something that's not a polynomial. Y equals Y. <laughs> You got me. It's not a polynomial. You did? No. I, 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 okay, good. Um, any other ideas? Y equals x. Y equals x is a polynomial. Oh, okay. Y equals 2. No, nope, that's polynomial. It's a good thing I asked. Anybody else? Rational functions are not polynomials. Square root functions are not polynomials. Polynomials involve only x, only raised to integral values. It's your constant, it's your line, it's your quadratic, your cubic, your quartic, quintic, sextic, heptic, octic, etc. etc. As soon as you make it a rational function, everything goes out the window. Not necessarily continuous. Piecewise functions, not continuous. Usually. We'll look a little bit more at those in a second. Okay, especially if you look at this, if you think about it logically, where's my asymptote in this function? Tree, right. All of a sudden we just created a discontinuity. Okay, so the polynomials are always continuous, so when you, uh, when you approach a problem where it has you identify whether or not it's continuous, you don't have to go through the formal definition, you just have to state, I know this function is continuous because it's a polynomial. It was so important I made it through that wavy thing. Oh. That too. Ooh. I don't know. I'm an expert. What about some positive functions? Well, the answer is right there. You put a continuous function inside a continuous function, it's also continuous. I'm going quick, I'm sorry. Little trigger review. I know it's harsh in only the second example. There's I've kind of answered the question I'm about to ask, but is the tangent function continuous? No. Why not? No. Trigonometric. Think about the graph of the tangent function. What on the graph of the tangent function makes it discontinuous? Asymptotes. Is that what you're going to say? Sorry. To it. it has asymptotes. Quick trig review, where are the asymptotes on the tangent function? Hmm. What's that? Yeah. You can do this in there, but you just give me one example. Is it zero? Pi over two, negative pi over two, pi, where is it? Pi over two. And then you recall in pre-calculus you went through that big hassle. Did, did you do n pi or k pi? N, okay. We used to do k and we changed to n, I don't know why. In case you forgot, that's what the trig or the tangent function looks like. Now, one thing you will see is they will give you functions that you know are discontinuous at some point, but you only look at part of the graph. So if I asked you to do some work with the tangent graph, but I only had you look at pi over 4 to negative, or sorry, negative pi over 4 to pi over 4, that part of the graph is continuous. It's when you start getting far enough out that you include the asymptotes that it all of a sudden becomes discontinuous. And we can go through the three steps for the formal definition, but I don't really think we have to. There's no value at pi over 2. It doesn't have a limit at pi over 2, and therefore those two don't match, and it goes right out the door. Okay. 
intermediate value term. Just like discontinuity, I have a simple example for you. Luke, how tall are you? 6'2". Six 6'2". Two. Six two. Were you always that height? No. No. So, how old do you think you, or sorry, how tall do you think you were in, I don't know, third grade? Approximate. You don't have to be exact. 4'10". Uh, 4'10". Beautiful. So you're 4'10 in third grade. Right? Now you're 6'2". <laughs> Somewhere along the line, you had to be 5'10". Somewhere along the line, you had to be 5'11". How many points did you have between 4'10 and 6'2", height-wise? A lot. Could you be more specific? It's a math class. Um, No, more than that. Okay. Did you ever go from being 5'6 to 5'7 instantly? No. No. You had to do all that 5'6 and a quarter, 5'6 and, you know, and, and all those incredibly deep, minute growth spurts. So we established that he started, I forgot already, 4'10? 5'10. No, what, 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 what were you in third grade? Fourth, so he, we established he went from 410 to 62 over a certain interval. From third grade to, are you a junior senior? Junior. Junior. Okay. We've got an interval there, and we've got a growth pattern. And he hasn't skipped any heights in there. So theoretically, he has an infinite amount of height, or an infinite number of values of height, between third grade and junior year. Does that make sense? Okay. You can't just jump heights. That's the basis that we use for the intermediate value theorem. So now we think about it as a graph. If I start at a value and the function is continuous and I end at another value, I've got to hit all the values in between. At least once. Okay, now the growth experiment or the, the growth example <clears throat> kind of breaks down because I don't think anywhere between third grade and junior year you shrunk at all, right? No, continuous growth, but that doesn't mean that the function can't go up and down. It just has to hit those values at least once. So that's what it says. And I want to break this down for you so you can get comfortable with this calculus speed. We established that the function is continuous first. You must have that chunk of information for the intermediate value theorem to apply on an interval. Okay. So for example purposes, f is Luke. His interval is third grade to junior year. F of A does not equal F of B, meaning he didn't start and stop at the same height. And we throw this value of K in there. It's some value between third grade and junior year. I chose 510 if I remember correctly. <laughs> If that's the case, that's got to happen at least one place. Somewhere between third grade and junior year, he must have been five foot ten. If you look at my graph, I start down here at one, I end at five. Notice these are y values. I start at y value of one, I go to a y value of five. If the function is continuous, I cannot get from one to five without picking up my pencil and not pass through, let's say, three. Does that make sense? Yes? Good. Then the application of this won't be that bad. If you understand the concept, how to use it is pretty straightforward. All right, everybody good to go here? Beautiful. All right, so that's what we talked about with Luke. Commonly, the intermediate value theorem is used to find zeros. That's a big thing for us. Where does this function equal zero? Or does this function equal zero? we can use the intermediate value theorem to find that. All right, so let's look at an example. I've got a cubic. Uh, just for giggles, how are we doing on time? Okay, we're all good. We're good. Either on your iPad 
if you have decimals handy, or on your calculator, please graph that function. If you don't have decimals, this might be a good time to get it out of um, whatever that is, self care center. What, what is it? Self care center. <laughs> 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 I heard there's a color in the Okay, so the nice thing about Desmos is that unlike your calculator, Desmos is manipulatable. I think I said that correctly. You can zoom in and zoom out using pinching and stuff like that. The calculator is pretty antiquated, but we still use it. I don't understand why. I would say for demonstration purposes, Desmos is going to work out a little bit nicer for you. But anyways, we have a cubic. I want to use the intermediate value theorem to show that that function has a zero. In other words, it crosses the x-axis somewhere between zero and one. So if you're on Desmos, you may need to zoom in between zero and one. If you're on your calculator, you may need to change the window. So change your x value to like negative one to two. If you're feeling saucy, you could go zero to one. I don't care. All right, so looking at the picture on your graphing device, is the answer yes or no? Okay, good. So we know what we're working towards. Now, they're not going to give you this kind of question on a calculator question because they know that you can just use a calculator to find it. They're going to do this on a non-calculator portion. And it goes something like this. The first thing we have to do in order to satisfy the intermediate value theorem is we have to establish that this function is continuous. Is this function continuous? Why? Boom. Done. How do you know it's a polynomial? Show that the polynomial function. Reading is a wonderful skill. Okay. Or it's a cubic, regardless. Now, if it's not a polynomial function, you're going to have to go back to the formal definition and prove it's discontinuous. Or not discontinuous. Not discontinuous would be continuous. OK. Beautiful. So we know it's continuous. Continuous because f of x is a polynomial. Okay. So I'm going to take this example, and I hope this helps you, but I'm going to relate it back to Luke. What I need to find out first is how tall Luke was at zero. In other words, I need the value of the function at zero. All right, help me out. How many digits? Um, just one. Negative one. Negative one, okay. By the way, how many digits in uh, AP standard is three? Now I need to know how tall he is in junior year, which is f of one, which is? Two. Good. And we're done. How do we know we're done? A zero must occur in zero to one because of IVT. came from here. Oh. Okay. It's what the problem asked. So what did we establish? By establishing that it's a polynomial, we know the function is continuous. And I'm asking the question, can I go from the y value of 0 to the y value of 1, sorry, the x value of 0 to the x value of 1 without crossing 0? And the answer is no, I can't. Because I go from negative 1 to 2. I think I said that wrong, didn't I? Can I go from the y value of negative 1 to the y value of 2 without crossing 0, is what I meant to say. And the answer is no, because it's continuous. 
you'll also notice that in some problems you might get more than one answer if you actually go and solve that. Now that would be the next step in the problem. Well, where does that happen? Set the function equal to zero, solve, and get your answers. Looking at the picture on your graphing device, how many zeros are there for that function? There's three. How many of those fall between zero and one? Oh, one. One. There's only one zero? I don't know why I said three. She said it like she was such an authority. <laughs> Zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Good job, Mom. <laughs> Way to lead us all down the dark side. <laughs> Questions? Did that already? That's what I did. Thank you. We're all done.